Welcome to Woodward Road and the E-Roads, Inella Road and Eastlands Crescent. The opening shot has a typical path across the Dulwich Fields, and the other shot is Inella Road, taken around 1906 because the road hasn't been uh, tarmacked over, but the curb is in. So you can date that to about 1906. These are the two maps, the Dulwich Estate map of 1876 and 1886. Here is Dulwich Village. Um, here are the shops. Here is Court Lane. And East and Woodward Road is roughly along this line here because it ends up at the plough. There's the plough here. That's Eastland's house. And these are the trees in front of Court Lane Gardens. If you go to 1886, uh, by that time, Woodward Road has been constructed. The plough is here. Um, and you can see how it comes into the village. And in fact, in that time, the entire road right down, there was no Carlton Avenue as such. The road right down to here was Woodward Road. Just in passing, you'll see this little uh, hatched area where Boval Road, Boval, as at that time, Boval Gardens and Milo Road was, and you can see R.E.P. Tebesquire. We'll come to him later because uh, he has quite an important impact. As you can see, in 1876, he's not there, and 1886, he is. Here's Dulwich Park, village again, burial ground on the corner, um, and the trees in front of Court Lane Gardens, which we saw last time. A couple of shots looking up um, from the junction of what is now Carlton Avenue and Court Lane. Ash Cottage here, you can see St Barnabas Church up here. You can just see the shops on the corner, the later shops, so we know it's taken after 1922, probably about 1930. This, of course, is much later. Uh, this is just a painting, but it's quite a nice painting showing the church and the spire. The spire, of course, is slightly later. That comes in 1906, 1908. There's Court Lane, Carlton Avenue, the junction here. We go further up. Uh, what is now Carlton Avenue. You can see it going ahead of you up here. You can see the houses over here. Here's the church. It was this definitely because the spa's there, it's taken after 1908. Um, and you can see the entrance to Woodward Road is just here. And then on the right, you have the houses which the Dulwich Estate built in the 1870s for the poor, for the poor residents. Um, and it's built by the Dulwich Village Cottage Company. But these, as you walk up what is now Carlton Avenue, you will see these on your right. And here is the corner. And you, some of you will know this as a sort of landscaped open space. Uh, we're quite lucky to have it because at one time, certainly in the 1920s, the intention was to put a petrol station on the side. Next one, and we're looking now on the left. That's, as you see it today, the picture on the right, number 23. But those of you with fairly short memories, I think, will remember that that used to be a garage there. And in fact, it was uh, builder J.H. Cooper who built Cartel Avenue, as we will see, and several other things. Uh, that was his yard, that was his works. Uh, and that was there until relatively recently. It's now, it's now a house, people have put back the window properly. Over the road, we're just going to look at uh, Cooper's um, history, if you like. He'd been working in East Dulwich for quite some time. Here is his firm, Cooper and Kendall Builders. And they're building near Champion Hill Station, or East Dulwich as we know it now. Uh, quite plush, nine room villas, um, you know, hot and cold baths, dry cellars, properly drained and perfect sanitary arrangements. That's what the Victorians were keen on. Um, not so much about... Uh, you know, ensuite bathrooms and things like that. And of course, the, the key point of buying in Dulwich is a residence having the educational advantages of Dulwich College. And depending on you where you live, those educational advantages were uh, you got your son into the college, no matter how stupid he was, because uh, you were on the estate. And this is some of the buildings he built before, we, we will meet him at Woodward Road, but here, corner of Glengarry Road. The original intention, they were going to build a pub on that site, uh, but they were turned down. Um, and he's got work here in East, that's the 
rebuilt Presbyterian Church Mance, which is rebuilt recently, but the house next door is an original uh, Joseph Cooper. On the other side of the road, similarly, East Dulwich Grove, unfortunately, the house where he lived um, has been knocked down, uh, was done in, uh, knocked down during the war bombed. Uh, and here he is in Carlton Avenue, um, which was his, uh, before he built in Woodward Road, his major project, last major project. Here's the 1906 map, which uh, I showed you before. Here's now Carlton, Ave well, Carlton Road, Carlton Avenue now. Here's the church, um, Decker Road, Desmond Fons Road, Court Lane, which we talked about last time, Dulwich Park. And here's Woodward Road coming up here. Here is the, uh, the, poor, people, the poor people's housing. And here is the yard, uh, Judge Cooper's yard. And you'll see a little red thing there, which we'll come on to shortly. Again, here we're coming up the road. Um, this is a shot we saw previously. There's the church. Here's the house on the right in white. And here's the house as it is today. Um, and it was built for a local doctor, Dr. Erickson Parrott, and it was called Whitecliff because clearly, as this picture shows, it was originally white, um, but it is no longer white. So at some point between a big Wardian period and now, the house has been re-rendered and left natural in the natural colour, uh, which most of the houses in Dulwich were, in fairness, before white paint came in. So it was unusual to have it painted white at that time when it was built. Now we go to the next, we're moving up Woodward Road now. We're looking to the left on the north side. Uh, here's the house we just saw on the corner. And we can see these houses slightly set back. They're slightly later than many of the others here. You can see it, they were built in 1914, 1915 between White Cliff and the side of these houses here. Um, they're very different. As I say, they are 10 years or so later than most of Woodward Road. And the reason they're here, or the reason they're late, of course, is here, because this is where the Iron Chapel stood. When St. Barnabas, when the first St. Barnabas was set up in, here in May 1891, the Reverend Nixon um, called the potential parishioners and they built the temporary iron church here on the corner. So here we are in Woodward Road and here is the temporary iron church. And they held services here until the church itself was finished uh, around 1900. And as I say, the town, this is a shot before the tower is built. Um, and it was knocked down, the, came down in 1913. And then that allowed Williams to build his houses. Then across the road, this is a shop, uh, a shot I showed last time. This is Decker Road, where again, the estates were trying to build houses for their poorer people. Um, several people have been complaining, well, Reggie, the Reverend Nixon of the church is one of them, been complaining about the lack of housing for poor people and how they had to live away. Um, and uh, anyway, the, church, the estate funded it. Um, of course, their idea of poor people and the realities of poor people was slightly different because most of the so-called poor people who could afford the rents could only afford the rents by splitting up the houses. So there was often two or three families living in any one of the houses. And here you have all the, all the good. You've got the manager, the architect, and the builder, Mr. Parker from Peckham. And of course, all the worthy uh, members of the Dulwich Estate uh, gov governing body. Again, this is a slide I showed last time. We're moving up Woodward Road, but we're looking to the right. Um, this is the housing by Desenfons Road, and this is the housing either side of Druce Road, and you've got Mr. Bendel on the right, and Gail, Mr. Gail Branson on the left. You can see the very different style of house. Um, both much the same price. We're looking at uh, 400, around 400 pound mark. This is what they would have cost at the time. Um, and here we have, again, Mr. Arthur Bendel work. He'd, um, he'd come from Streatham. He built in Turney Road, he built in Ruskin Walk, um, and he built in Cropstead Road uh, before he came. And then he moved on to Court Lane, as we saw last time, and lived in his rather grand uh, house at 124. Here's Gail Branson. These are his houses in Thornton Heath, where he started before he came to Dulwich. Um, and I've left these two quotes in from before, as they're very appropriate for today. 
In those days, if you didn't have your children vaccinated for smallpox, the police came round and you went to court and here he is in court. Um, and he was also a bit of a, uh, a fun loving guy compared with Bendel, who was a rather more serious Baptist. And he becomes, he's worshipful master of the Selwyn Lodge of Freemasons. And um, interesting thing, of course, he died much earlier than his, uh, his friend, Mr. Bendel. But let's move on. Now we're looking at Coopers. We're again on the north side. Um, so on the left as you go up, and these are Coopers houses. They're very similar in size to the ones at the bottom of Carlton Avenue. And they're quite, this, uh, this one has been worked on a bit because you can see the red brick has been colored. Uh, but some of the detailings, well worth a look, closer look. I mean, one tends to drive up there and not think to look too closely, but they really are rather well detailed. And again, here you see his, his original offer was a 400 pound house and the state and the estate bid him up to 450. So this is what these would have cost back in the day, 450 pounds. Um, and he was living in Worcester Lodge in East Dulwich Grove at the time. And here you have, we're still on the north side of the road. Here is uh, Cooper, Cooper's houses, and here is Branson houses, so you can see the difference. And the way, the reason, well, the they divided the house, the fields, these would have been field boundaries. So they would have let the field to one builder and then the other field to the other builder. So Branson was slightly, slightly more glamorous, I think, in terms of his, his architecture, but we're still talking, you know, 450 pounds. You can just see here, this is one of the ones that was bomb damaged. I think this is um, 124, 124 and 126, which were rebuilt after the war. And here you have a bit more Gail Branson. And I hope some of you have looked at, look at the doors, look at the detail. And the great thing about it, pretty well everybody has kept them. But they spent money on that. And these sort of timber screens with the glass in it and the palaces and things around the entrance. Um, like today, you know, builders knew what sold, uh, sold properties and it was the entrance way. It was the, the front facade. Less people in those days appeared to be less concerned about the interiors, but they were very concerned about how it looked. And this is a description, um, 600 pounds, roof tile. And they want the, what they were getting a bit tired of because he tended to use this design everywhere. Everybody was saying, oh, come on, let's, um, let's have some different designs. And as you'll see, he did change things a bit later. We're now on the south side, uh, back opposite. Uh, this is he, number 97, which is his own house on the corner of Dover Court Road South. And you can see here that these houses have flat, have flat bays, whereas other houses had the roofs over, but the doors, and the balconies and the entrance halls are still the same. Uh, when these houses were built, of course, there was no numbering, no house numbering. And I just thought I'd list a few of the, of the names. Some of them are fairly obviously. Others are, um, Witpochi is a gold mine in Johannesburg, um, but they obviously reflect the initial owners. I think they were selected by the people who bought or rented the houses in many cases, as most people to start within Woodward Road rented. Uh, the builder kept the houses, or actually he generally put them in the name of his wife, Ada. So Ada Branson, if you, if you just look at the, uh, at the estate record, would appear to be a very wealthy lady because she owns an awful lot of houses in Woodward Road. Uh, this is just to give you a feeling of uh, how things change and how things don't change. Um, these are just a random set of extracts from newspapers of the time about Woodward Road. And in the first one, you have um, a mugging, uh, two boys mugging another schoolboy, stealing his watch, uh, rather than, of course, now would be his mobile phone. Uh, this was a chap charged with burglary, um, stealing an overcoat worth seven pounds from uh, Mr. Tarver JP, obviously a local worthy. This poor chap here, um, his daughter disappeared and he never did find her. There was quite a lot of newspaper reports, but uh, she just disappeared. And this poor lady, this fatal window cleaning, she was dusting the windowsill and around the window when she fell out of the window. 
uh, onto the ground below. This poor Alice Leonora Ethel Matthews, age 29, um, at number 46. Um, this I found quite interesting. This is another criminal one, a man with record. Some poor chaps walking up Woodward Road, and I think he stops on the corner of Dover Court, and he gets arrested. And when he goes to court, he hasn't actually done anything. He's just loitering. And they uh, and the detective, the sergeant, uh, reads out his previous conviction, and he's sent away for three months uh, without doing anything. I think when he says that he was a marked man, uh, it's a fair, a fair comment. This is another thing you see quite often um, on the stage or the area, era, sorry, ERA, which is another um, stage paper of people advertising their availability. Uh, I've not been able to trace Mr. Herbert Colley, so I don't think he was very well known, but he was obviously a comedian and a vocalist, and at liberty meant he was free to be engaged. Uh, he was looking for work, basically, and he lived at number four. Um, bit of bankruptcy, Mr. Miller. Um, who was a cabinet maker, declared bankrupt. And more perhaps the point, the Daily Mirror down here, somebody had lost their Persian cat with orange colored eyes. Quite why you would advertise the loss in the Daily Mirror, I'm not quite sure, but um, you did in those days. Anyway, it gives you an idea of the sort of, I mean, what's interesting about Woodward Road is that the people who lived there uh, were middle-class certainly, but lower, not so well paid. A lot of teachers, a lot of LCC teachers lived in the road, um, and a lot of relatively poorer, I mean, it's all relative being poor, but uh, they weren't sort of um, high grade professionals or businessmen or anything like that. They were workers, employees, teachers. That's just a shot of a gain of the south side of the road. That's um, Mr. Branson, and sh just showing you different, he would keep the same style of house, but by having a pitched gable and a flat roof, he would try and pretend that they were a little bit different. But if you actually look, of course, they're uh, exactly the same. Uh, it's just the roof is slightly different. Um, this is uh, now what one, what people probably, no reason why they should realize, but as you go up, towards the end of uh, Woodward Road, if you've been there in 1911 or even in 1920, um, you would have seen Woodland, uh, Eastland's house, um, with a garden backing onto Woodward Road. And uh, you've got here this little bit where Branson, they, Eastland's house was getting, originally it was a grand house, but by the time of the turn of the 20th century, it was a, it was a hotel, a boarding house, basically, and um, with large grounds, which the estate chipped away at. Firstly, for Dover Court Road South, they took a bit there uh, before the war. And again, here, the back, back along Woodward Road, the land, um, we got Branson here, taking, whoops, taking 205 feet with his 150 depth away in order to that the lease at Easton's could be cheaper and he promised to build so many houses etc and he did and he got and he did actually start to change his design because if you look at these that's his standard type of house and this is his new type of house but he's building here by the time he's building sort of in the first world war 1915 1916 and you see here he comes to the estate in june 16 and says um, in fact, just before the government um, effectively closed down speculative house building uh, to concentrate on the war effort, he said, you know, obviously there's difficulties in getting people to do the work, prices are rising, he really can't carry on, and um, he's got so many houses left, and they agree, and the estate allowed him off, uh, and he doesn't start again till 1919, which is these here, even though they have the parapet walls coming through the roof, which signifies generally that they should be pre-war. And it's obviously a pre-war design, um, but built after the war in 1919. And so here you've got this sort of rather nice Tudor Beethan look, nothing wrong with that. And you get this slightly odd one at number 27 and number 29. It is by him, not quite sure why it's different. Interesting that they've got garages. Um, because cars are starting to come in now, people are, are being able to afford cars. But we're going to stop there and move over the road.
because we're not going to carry on on that side of Woodward Road. We're going to go back to some maps. And I'm going to show you again, just to remind you, the route of Woodward Road, which is about here. But if you look at the two maps here, you get a very, you get, this is the 1886 map. And here again, I'll refer you to this RP Teb estate, and you can just see Boval, well, in those cases, Boval Gardens, now Boval Road and Milo Road. Uh, and you can see later is also, so this is land that was originally on the estate, but is now off the estate. And those of you who live in Boval Road and Milo Road and on the top of Woodward Road on the left-hand side will know that you are not on the Dulwich estate where everybody else is. And it's quite uncommon for an area of land that was on the estate to effectively become freehold owned by somebody else. And the question one asks is why? And the answer of course is Mr. Teb. Um, and we're now going to learn the reason for the construction of Woodward Road and Mr. Teb's um, various machinations with the Dulwich estate uh, in the last years of the 19th century. Here he is, Robert Palmer Teb. He um, comes from Manchester. Uh, he's moved down to London. He's basically an auctioneer state agent and in fact a housing developer. And you can see how he moves up in the world. These two of his houses, he lived in, the, this is still here. This, as you drive around Tulse Hill, you see this one on the corner, he lived there. This is still here on Crystal Palace Park Road. These are substantial properties. He was a pretty wealthy man. I thought originally that he had just, he was just a developer who'd come in from central London and bought up, but in fact, not so. He lived locally, as we can see here. Um, you can see he's in, he's in Sydenham and he's, uh, it's not really until we get to the 1891 that you realize he tells the truth of what his business is. He's a dealer in land and a house agent. And these houses, if you think, I mean, these are substantial houses, but these are even more substantial. So he, he did pretty well for himself um, when he died back here in 1907. But there's another Dulwich connection, and this is his two sons who went to the college. And here's the record out of Ormiston's um, 1926 record, which is, has proved very useful in research because more people than you think are moved to Dulwich in order to send their sons to the college, as they do today, or their daughters to Jags and, and, and sons and both to Alliance. But here is Albert Edward Teb. The eldest son, fairly short thing, not that, not that well known. Um, the youngest son, actually quite well known. He was a, an, a doctor, he was an expert in tuberculosis, tuberculosis. But his other frame, uh, claim to fame, and it's a pity I haven't been able to find a photograph of him. Um, he was um, Joseph Conrad, the author's personal physician. And there's this article here, which I found on the web, What Has Happened to Poor Teb, a biographical sketch of Conrad's physician. And in fact, he was very well known in literary circles as a doctor, whether I can't believe they all had tuberculosis, but um, he was very well known. So quite a, quite a famous guy, possibly more so than his dad, but perhaps not as rich. And here we have the key. Uh, this is Oakfield, which is number 41, um, you know, on the corner of College Road and the South Circular. And this is the property that Teb bought in the late 1870s. Um, it's a long, I'm not going to dwell on who he bought it from. Well, he bought it from the chap living in Bell House. But anyway, he bought it, he acquired it. Not quite sure whether he originally intended to live in it, um, but, or whether he did actually buy it as a speculative um, opportunity. But very soon afterwards, um, he uh, was talking to the estate by 1880, 1881, about um, the housing development he intended to do. And this is the description. Um, he was going to build, much like you have Frank Dixon Way coming through here now, um, he was going to connect with the back of Allison Grove and he was going to build a road all around here. He was going to keep the original house, but with a much smaller garden, going to get rid of the lake and all of this. And he was going to build a series of much smaller um, 500 to 700 pound houses. 
um, the estate were um, a little bit concerned because this is obviously a prime spot. Um, they didn't quite know what to do. So we'll move on to the next. He, he tried to sell the house and here are the um, auction particulars. And you can see he was selling it. This is the house on the corner. Many of you will know it. Uh, and you can see he's selling it as freehold residential or as a building estate. Um, and uh, this is the sort of, this is the discussions. The estate had discussions with him and said, how can we, um, you know, how, what's the, what can we do to stop you doing this? Uh, because there was no planning in those days. He could do it. Um, and he said, basically, well, give me some land somewhere else. And there was a discussion about uh, exchanging the site of Oakfield, which was a lot less than 15 acres, for 15 acres of land in Lordship Lane, which is the um, patch of land we saw um, earlier on the map. Um, he didn't sell it by auction. Um, so in the end, they did a deal. And that's where Woodward Road came from. In order to access or to provide building frontage for his land, the estate agreed to build Woodward Road. Obviously, they would also benefit from getting building frontages on their part of the land. And he agreed to pay half the cost of the road. So basically, from where the, the estate stops just before you get to Beauval Road, right up to, to the end where the library is, uh, he agreed to pay for that. But the the way the uh, surveyor sold it to the governors, of course, was that it would give them building frontages as well, and they would aim, um, you know, they would get lots of money through their ground rents. So there we go. There's the house. There's the deal on the table. So the deal is um, Teb hands back this site, and it's only recently that the new house has been going up in the garden there, and he gets 15 acres over and it's called the Townley Park Estate. So here is Woodward Road. Uh, here is Lordship Lane. Here is the plough over here on the left. And he's a very canny, canny bloke. He sells it off um, slowly over, over, over many years. So he's, he's acquired it by the mid 1880s, 1884, 1885. He's still selling it 1892, 1896. He doesn't want to flood the market. He's very careful. And you can see here, he's selling this particular sale. He's selling these green properties here and here. Um, these ones have been built. He hasn't done anything with Bobel Road or Milo Road. Um, he's a very canny operator and he sells them. And they're all sold at the, at the, at the plough, at the pub. They put up a marquee in the grounds and um, they're sold there. He throws on a lunch and drinks and everything. And um, it all goes very well. The newspapers, Local newspapers at the time were most impressed by his, uh, his business acumen. Give you a few couple of shots of Beauvoir Road, which was built slightly later. Um, generally smaller houses and smaller builders. Um, this is just a little, little quote from the South London Press about um, letting, letting the houses. If you walk along Beauvoir Road, you'll see that there's seldom more than four, sometimes eight houses of a particular type before the changes. So this was much smaller builders. You can just see the, the steam thing in the road up there. And again, the road is not made up. The pavements are, the curbs are there, but the road is not done. So it's about 1900. And there's a view of it today. I can, as I say, there's uh, much more variety in the housing types than you get on the Dulwich estate. But let's move to the pub. We've talked about the pub. That's where they held the held the um, auction. Uh, here's the pub today. Well, not quite today, perhaps, but uh, um, and that building dates from 1858. So it's quite old, but not. And there's a 1930s version. And there's here's the number 12 bus in the 1930s. You can just see the pub behind it. But this was taken, as I say, in about 1935. Uh, just after Charrington's had taken over the uh, City of London Brewery and changed it. Because when we look at earlier shots, you'll see there's far more stuff on the front than on the side of the pub. Here's the original plough in. Now, when, uh, when we wrote the pub book, uh, Pubs of Dulwich and Herne Hill, still available in Brown Green Shop, uh, a few years ago, we thought the pub had been built in about 1800. Uh, only goes to show how wrong we were here. 
We've more recently found the Sun Life Fire Insurance Certificate in uh, uh, dating it to 1791. Quite why you'd want to fire insure, insure for fire this sort of rather decrepit timber shed, who knows? Um, we trace it back here to 1774 uh, when there was a robbery at the at the plough. There were robbers going round robbing um, on the slightly outer outer suburbs of London. Here is the plough here. But the more recent one, we found one dating back to 1737, uh, which is about some poor chap who used to work at the Green Man, uh, where the, uh, the, the corner of the uh, South Circular and Lordship Lane, now the Grove Tavern. Uh, and it says he went from the plough and harrow in Lordship Lane. Uh, with this man when he was killed, but I cannot believe there are more than one. There are not many, there are no other pubs in Lordship Lane. So I think it was originally the Plough and Harrow. And we have a date here of 1737, which means there's been a pub on that site coming up 300 years, which is pretty impressive. Here it is again. Um, this is a famous quote about the confirms the old fashioned wooden structure. This is about taken about 1820s. And um, this inscription in the window, Thomas Jones dined here, ate six pounds of bacon and drank 19 pots of beer. And as this says, this record of disgust and gluttony was no doubt swept away when the plough was rebuilt some years ago, which means in 1858. So the plough, we know this was knocked down in 1858 and the current building put up. Here are, is a list of the licensees. Um, now that doesn't mean owners, often the licensees were just managers. The pubs were opened by other people, owned by other people. Although that's not to say someone, I think the Coombs did own it, uh, father and son, um, and all these different, um, we'll meet Augustus George Mann, Alfred Henry Mann, and Augustus George Mann Jr. and the family, the Mann family, you will meet shortly afterwards. And the interesting thing is here, there's a famous, uh, let me just come on to the advertisements. Here's two advertisements with the pub being sold. And you can see here, it, um, it talks here about Mr. Marmon, the proprietor, this is in 1869, and also the late Mr. Henry Barker, uh, and these are not licensees. So these are people who actually owned the pubs. Um, as they used to say, mine host, perhaps. But these are the people who owned them. These are two adverts. Victorian pub adverts are fascinating. Look, uh, the, um, they're very optimistic and they're always saying how marvellous it all is and what fantastic location is and what how well the business could be if only it was run properly. Um, you know, and this one here, basically, you can have it for free. It's £123 for the lease, but if you re lease out the stable, it's it's 103 So it's only costing you £20 a year. Pretty reasonable. Uh, but the interesting thing is here is these, um, the owners of the pub, there was a famous, some of you will know, if you've read our pub book, there's a famous case about the Half Moon Tavern, about uh, Casson versus Hine, where... Uh, Mr. Casson sold, no, it was Mr. Hine who sold it to Casson, uh, sold the pub um, for £64,000, which if you think about it in the 1890s was an incredible sum of money. That would have bought uh, all of the houses in Stradella Road and Winterbrook Road. So that's a huge sum of money. And it was based on um, the takings, the so-called takings, but of course the takings were falsified. And there was, a, and the case at the Plow is the case of Cookson versus Cooksey. And Cookson had purchased the pub from Cooksey uh, for £35,000. Um, and he'd been shown the books as to how, but all the books were wrong. And, the, and what transpired when it went to court, although the poor chap who'd, who bought it for more than it's worth um, lost and he ended up going bankrupt, it turned out that. Um, Cooksey, who was a, basically a crook, was paying his staff to pour the beer away um, and nicking, taking the spirits to another pub that he owned. 
um, generally in order to falsify the figures. So it looked as if the business was much better than it really was. Because in the 1890s, pubs were becoming very valuable. The opportunities to earn money, um, you know, cash, it was a good cash business. Uh, and um, there was a huge amount of uh, fraud going on. Here we have the plough taken about 1890 uh, with a couple of tilling. There's a tillings bus in front. Um, I can't say whether it was at the 1897 service, but the plough, as we will see shortly and with Mr. Tilling, was a major bus terminus. And the reason for this is if you went into town, if you lived in East Dulwich and you wanted to go into town by bus, there was no bus running down Lordship Lane. There was a bus from what is now the, uh, it was the Magdala, um, opposite Townley Road. There was a bus which went there through to Peckham, through East Dulwich Grove Station, uh, sorry, East Dulwich Station, and then to Peckham. Obviously, there was no horse-drawn bus could get up Dog Kennel Hill. It was just too steep. And it's worth, those of you go into East Dulwich again, go to Townley Road and then walk south towards the plough and you'll be going up a pretty steep hill. And in fact, that hill, what they call Dulwich Hill, has a gradient of one in 14 and is steeper than Dog Kennel Hill. So there was no way any horse bus could get up that either. So basically the plough as the terminus was the terminus for buses which went down Barry Road to Peckham. I mean, uh, Tilling was based in Peckham uh, and was a pretty well organized bus. And he was a job master. He ran buses amongst other things, but generally his business was letting out horse and uh, pony and cart carriages um, to private to private owners just uh, to use, a bit like hiring a car, very simple. Here's a shot in Barry Road, there's a horse-drawn bus, uh, there's a motor bus, so that's taken 1910, 1912. And here's a comment, a letter from Thomas Tilling in the South London Press, saying that even in Barry Road, and if you actually start at the, at the Peckham Rye end and, and walk up it, it is, it's not that steep, but it is quite a hill. And he's basically saying that the poor horses that were drawing these heavy buses up there were so knackered that they had to be rested or put on alternative, alternative duties uh, the following week. And he need, I mean, they need, we have no understanding now the number of horses they needed to make a horse bus operation work because pretty well the horses had to be changed after every single run. And that's where he did it. He had his stables in Milo Road. Those of you who go down there now, of course, there's a fence here, there's a few garages. Uh, but in those, in back at the turn of the 20th century, it was Thomas Tilling's <coughs> stables. And you've got here, he sold up, once, once he changed from horse-drawn buses to motorized buses, of course he didn't need stables, so here we are, we have the site being sold in 1913. Um, and the other, and then the next occupier is this, uh, the Earliest Resilient Wheel Company, who were producing um, a wheel made of metal springs. It didn't have, you couldn't pump it up with air, it was a solid wheel. It was for trucks and steam engines and things. I don't think in retrospect, it was that successful, but they, um, they were here for quite some time. Anyway, so that's my, that's the, if you've ever gone down Milo Road, I know there's a gate there now, there's three houses in Milo Road and this, and that's it. But let's go back to the pub. Here we are, here's the, here we have Mr. Mann, who we talked about briefly, and we'll just see shortly again. The City of London Brewery, uh, taken over by Charrington's. And we can pretty well date this shot. You've got the tram here, so it's after 1906. But the horse buses are still running, so it's before 1910 uh, when the motorised buses took over. So I reckon it's about 1908, um, and man's the pub, the licensee's name on the door there, and there's the the tram coming down. But trams, there's more to it. Here's a 1950s shot just before trams disappeared. Here's the pub here over there on the right. Here are the buses parked in front of it. No alfresco dining in those days. It was a bus park. Uh, but here we go down. 
But the trams, the one thing most people don't know is the electric trams were not the first ones. Here is Woodward Road, here is the plough, and this is an old ordnance survey showing a track down here, and it goes down, I think it's Landles Road, and this was the Peckham and East Dulwich Tram Company. And these were horse-drawn trams, and this is a typical shot of a horse-drawn tram. One has to say it was, um, they started laying the tracks in the road in the 1880s, because in those days they had to get a parliamentary bill uh, which allowed them to compulsory per or compulsorily purchase or get access to the road to put the tram lines in. They put the tram lines in, it took forever. The actual trams ran for about three years in the 1890s. Um, not, not a success because um, with the buses running and everything, it, was, it just didn't work. And, and in fact, their tracks were taken over in 1900s when the LCC's electric tram came along. But just an intriguing side. Here's a couple of buses. Here's Tilling's early buses, all number 12, because number 12 is one of the oldest routes uh, in Dulwich. Um, there we go. Happy chaps in there. And more of them. That's an early 1920s number 12, and that's a 1930s number 12. You see someone just jumping on it. Uh, no health and safety in those days. It was going to the Dulwich Library. And here the Dulwich, Dulwich the Plough and the Dulwich Library. Here's an interesting thing. Those of you who know it, again, here's the Lloyds Bank. Lloyds Bank is the second building on the site because originally it was these, the public toilets. And obviously the reason for the public toilets was because of the buses just across the road in, in, the, in the plough. So here we're going over the road, the library. So Henry Irving laid the foundation stone. As we say here, it's an issue. Passmore Edwards paid 70, gave 75,000 pounds. It's a memorial to Edward Alain. Dulwich, uh, the estate gave the, the land. Um, you know, it's, it was a substantial and still is a great facility. Uh, there's the church, there's the crossroads about here. Here's another shot, there's Sir Henry Irving, there's more general, you can see LA, Inella Road down there. And uh, yeah, you know, like social media today, a library in the town was something special. You know, it's um, the mechanism for good which public libraries afforded was of incalculable value. So it was, um, yeah, pretty, but let's move on to Woodward Road. And the reason I missed out the top end of Woodward Road, because moving on to Mr. Teb, was again here, because this was done by a builder called John Frampton. Uh, the designs by Alan and Hoare, a surveying firm in Hampstead. And he did this and Inella Road. So we're looking here about 1900. He, had done some work on the other side, on this, if you like, on the non-estate side of the road. There are three of his houses here on the corner of Beauville Road. Um, there's his own house up in Belvoir Road, or that's his house, and a series of houses in Belvoir Road. And this quote here, uh, if only they'd known, it says, Mr. Frampton has built houses in Woodward on freehold land purchased from Mr. Teb, which are these. Also in Belvoir Road, and judging from these properties, he builds very well. Uh, he obviously owned a lot of other houses and uh, his solicitors. Why quite why he had a solicitor in Westmoreland, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but anyway, he could get the funding and they thought, yep, he's the guy for the job. These are the two houses, another two houses he built for Mr. Teb. Interesting here that the owner is Frederick Powell, who was licensee at the Mont Schumacher Road, the Montpellier Tavern, for about 40 years in the late 19th century. But these are rather classy, classy houses. Over we go. Uh, this is John Frampton. This is his career. He starts in Dorset. Uh, his father has left. His mother is fairly poor. He comes, acts as, by the time he's just before 30, he's in living in Henslow Road here, um, uh, a, a builder. And then he's moving up. And even, even in his final things, I don't think he built this. This is in Underhill Road. He was living here. And the reason is, if you like, he came up and went down and he went bankrupt. Um, he underestimated a contract for the Campbell Borough Council for some on the Grove Lane estate and was declared bankrupt. 
and this gave a whole lot of problems in uh, Woodward Road and Inella Road and made things took a heck of a lot longer than they wanted to. So here we are, here is number one. Um, built, uh, it was altered for a doctor. Doctors tended to take corner, substantial, always substantial, but corner properties. And they would have had a brass plate and interestingly, a red light. So that when you walked along a street, you would see, and you were looking for a doctor because there was, um, the red light would be the giveaway. Um, in fact, it went to a dentist, but there we go. So here we go. And I mean, you're looking here, these are about five or 600 pounds at the time. Um, I've got an old postcard of this one. And here it's up for sale in 1909. It doesn't tell me how much. Um, one of the things is quite interesting in Inella Road and even this part of Woodward Road, um, Dulwich Park is mentioned. It was like Dulwich Park was the suburb. It wasn't Dulwich, it wasn't Woodward Road, it was Dulwich Park. So these are the houses and here they are today. And there's the, um, and we're going down the hill here. This is number 25. This was the house he built for himself, not that he ever lived in it. Um, and these are the ones, Gail Branson on the right. And you can see here, if you look at these, they're very similar to his earlier houses on the other side of the road. So here's his own house. And these are the eight semis he built here. Um, and uh, yeah, the stables and value 604 pounds. So we're now in Inella Road, uh, about 1900. Uh, the first two semis, they're a series of semis, as you all know. Uh, these are the first two to set out, numbers one and number three. And um, as quite common with um, the architects and surveyors, the, Mr. Barry, they got the dimensions wrong. Um, and um, there was a little, bit of, um, a little bit of a spat with the estate because they noticed that he built a double-fronted one here. And as I said, he had agreement with Mr. Mann, the landlord of the plough, to build a double fronted house on the plot. And that's number one, which is uh, even now the, the biggest house on the street. Um, and then you go down, as you go down the road, they tend to get slightly lower as, as times got harder and he ran out of money. And here's Mr. Mann, he is the landlord of the plough, a substantial, um, substantial chap. He was a butcher originally, worked his way up, um, and he was chairman of the Campbellwood Licensed Vittlers. And they took uh, the vestry to, or threatened to take the vestry to court because the vestry, Campbellwood vestry, had upped their charges. Because pubs were changing hands for so much money, uh, the vestry thought they'd get a bit of the action and put up the rates, basically. Um, and you see, he, he led a group of local uh, publicans um, and uh, he was called here, the heading was here in the newspaper was the dogged man does it. And so here he is, Augustus Mann, not to be confused with Augustus Mann, the conductor, um, but he was a real go ahead guy and he lived in number one. Um, this shows you one of the problems that Frampton, other than his bankruptcy, of course, was that um, E.C. Barry had become the new uh, estate surveyor in 19, um, 1900, and he was anxious to show that he was on the ball where his father had not been. Um, and here's one of the things um, you'll notice, some have bays and some have flat bays. And there's an article here about how um, Frampton couldn't, couldn't lease the houses with flat fronts as opposed to bay fronts. And he asked permission to change it, even though he'd agreed with um, Barry, C. C. Barry to have different types of houses. It was clear these were a problem. Uh, although, funnily enough, these two, of course, are still there today. It's still flat fronts, but the others were, were worked on. So this is one of the things at the talk last time I was asked to talk a little bit more about the social side of it. So we'll start here with the Dulwich Estate rent roll. And it shows the people who actually owned the houses. Uh, and you can see there were individuals where I put owned and the majority of the houses were rented. So they were owned by an individual, or in this case, a syndicate, R.H. Scott and others. I've not been able to track R.H. Scott and others down, but I have been able to track Mrs. Stannan because she owned quite a lot of them on the other side of the street. And here she is. 
Um, she was married to the Reverend Louis Stannon, who was the vicar of St. Bartholomew's in Shepparton Road, Islington. Now, quite how she could afford to buy so many houses isn't clear, although when I looked at the properties here in Milner Square and Highbury Place that the family lived in, albeit she was less than half his age, she was his second wife, um, they're pretty substantial properties. So I think he must have been pretty rich anyway. And when he died, um, well, they were, you know, she used the money to buy these houses. Uh, and then the number of 72% of the houses had a live in servant uh, in Inella Road. And the other thing that I've spoken to people who've lived in the road a long time, of course, a lot of the houses were requisitioned during the Second World War. And some of these were quite um, still in council occupation until relatively recently. So that shows you, but as I say, 70, a lot of houses had servants. Uh, and here's a, here's a few sales particulars. These are the two houses. This is what he taught, two semi-detached villas, Dulwich Park again, adjoining Dulwich Park, healthiest spot in London, 550 pounds each, 50 pound down. I don't think that's bad, but it shows his, his office was at 25 Woodward Road, which we saw earlier. And here's it being sold again in 1908. Um, you know, 24 Rhinella Road, which is this one here. Attractive residence with all modern improvements, Dulwich Park. So uh, we don't know what she sold it for, unfortunately, but um, anyway, that's. But here's again a few of the, the people who lived in um, Rhinella Road. And this is just to show that the estate was, um, could be as difficult then as they can be now. This poor chap erected some trellis work on top of his fence to prevent his being overlooked. Um, and uh, the estate sort of said, well, come on, you can't do that. And Mr. Savage, who was a timber merchant in Peckham, got his solicitor to write in. Um, and in fact, they succumbed. They agreed that he, he'd uh, taken the right thing. So they, they were not going to interfere. I think they probably would interfere now. This here is, whoops, number four. Uh, Mr. George P. Nightingale, I've no idea what he did other than he wrote <coughs> to a newspaper, uh, had seen a butterfly nearly at Dulwich Park in the winter. And this correspondent replied that it would be better if it was Mr. Butterfly of Dulwich Park who saw a nightingale rather than Mr. Nightingale of Dulwich Park who saw a butterfly. Probably not funny to us, but obviously they thought it was. Um, this is number 14, marriages. And this is the interesting thing about uh, research, uh, historical research, it's just a throwaway line. Uh, you see this, the Eager, Mrs. Eager and the Reverend Eager owned uh, a couple of the, uh, one of the houses. And it just talks about, and you type, and you put in Wal Waldo McGillicuddy name into uh, Mr. Google, and you find in fact that he was the founder of uh, the boys clubs, he was a really, really well-known character at the time, even though his parents were a fairly minor rector in Cornwall, how the heck they could afford a property in Ionella Road. But anyway, but he was certainly a player as it were. This is a sadder thing. This is the father here, um, father of Miss Theobald, Edward Theobald, was in fact the, um, the accountant for Thomas Tilling's buses. Uh, but this poor girl, which was only 19, was drowned um, in Hastings. And they say, of course, if there hadn't been a rail strike, she would have left earlier and um, it never would have happened. Sorry, these are other owners. This is number eight. This is William Daly. He ended up living in Court Lane. We saw him uh, last time at number 126, but he was the managing director of Howard Wall Limited, and they made tape measures and tie backs for plants and other things. They're still going, still going today. Um, you have here 15 Al Little Road, John Alabaster, who owned Beatty's Ginger Beer and Mineral Water Factory in the 30s. That's the third dates of when they lived in the road. Uh, and we've got here Sidney Alfred Thew who was a, um, a dry salter and uh, their company here, Few Art and Co, still going today. So these were wealthy businessmen um, 
living there. They weren't sort of teachers and, and clerks and other people like that. These tended to be wealthier businessmen here. But the funniest one here is, it's not funny really, it was Samuel Oliver, who was his, his gave his, in 1911, gave his um, business the grinder of coal dust for foundries, which you wouldn't think would be uh, that much fun. But again, going into Mr. Google, and he may be discussed at our next talk, um, Samuel Oliver was the Honorary Secretary of the International Democratic Association and a serious player in, um, the, uh, in getting uh, British support for the Paris Commune in 1871. And he had dealings with Karl Marx, with the, although he was perhaps seen, I think, uh, so, well, not so much by Karl Marx, but by the organisation as slightly bourgeois. Um, but quite a character and interesting that how you would somebody who was really into, um, you know, democratic government things would end up living in a house on one of the most traditional and old fashioned estates in London. But anyway, an interesting guy, well worth a look on, uh, on Google. And here we have coming to the end of the road. That's uh, again, probably a little bit later, about 1908, 10. Uh, the road appears to be tarmacked by then, trees in the road, and there's the looking up the hill. So we go around the corner uh, to Eastlands. Eastlands is still here in 1930, uh, not for long. Uh, it's run by Mr. Hitchison. Uh, and it, as I said earlier, it's a sort of um, residential hotel. Um, he's had enough, he wants to go, he's gonna surrender the lease. They can't get him to agree, but in the end he does. And here's the, and they pay this company, William Marshall, 142 pounds 10 uh, to knock it down. So at that point, the land is finally available. And here we have Easton's Crescent, um, the Easton's building site. Here is the details. Um, Henry and William, well, William Wilmot is the builder here. Henry Wilmot was his father, who's the, and they had, He'd been building previously, but he was a member of, he was a Camberwell representative of the estate's governors. So it's quite interesting when you read the minutes of uh, when his son got the job, he leaves the room. There's a note saying he left the room. But here's the six, this is the information, William Wilmot. He's living on Poplar Walk in Denmark Hill, um, where you would see other similar houses. It's a bit deja vu. I mean, you look at these two houses here, which will um, you can see those all over Dulwich, Hearn Hill, and as we'll see later. Anyway, but here you go, and this is the and look at the prices. This is what they would have cost to build. And here, there, there's an argument when they when they get the job, where they're going to start. Are they going to start at the Dover Court Road end, or are they going to start at Court Lane end? And it's quite clear that they should start at Court Lane end. And here are the two houses at the Court Lane end on which they started. Um, this is Henry and William Wilmot, a little bit of history of them. Uh, Father Henry had been an estate agent at this house, 81 Grove Vale on the corner of, um, I've forgotten anyway, there it is. Uh, that's his house in Dulwich Village, which we saw last time. And these are typical houses of his, as I say, this one's in Colliston Road, this is in Brantwood Road, you would find others. Uh, they were quite a a busy builder and this was their pretty well standard design but i've got here some original drawings of easton's crescent um these are the this is the front elevation of one of the detached houses uh you can see the the architect up above um, from north london there's the elevation here are the plans these are the um copies of the original drawings um, Nothing, I mean, not out of the ordinary for the time, but interesting in that we still have them and the estate still has them. There's some typical shots of Easton's Crescent. There's, there's the detached house. There's the more typical Wilmot type design. These, he was obviously, and here again, he was obviously asked by the estate to do something a little bit different. So he sort of copied really Gail Branson in Woodward Road. Uh, and if you didn't know better, you might think they were the same builder, but they're not. Uh, they are here by Mrs. Wilmots. And this is the house's completions. 
1933, 34, and 35. Uh, and the builder himself, William Wilmot, lived at number 19. Um, not so many, uh, it's been unfair to say famous or interesting people, it's just that they were, they didn't appear in the newspapers, so we can't really track them down. I mean, we have them on the um, electoral registers, but that doesn't tell us what they did. So it's quite, uh, they're more ordinary people than perhaps lived in Anella Road. Um, and that is where I'm going to end. There's the shot of Anella Road, which you saw at the beginning, uh, looking, I think, looking down. So those would be the even number houses. Again, the mud road. So we're looking at about 1906 or seven. Um, and that's it, really. So I'm good to. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, for such an interesting tour.